say a huge thank you for all my birthday greetings after my last video. I had an absolutely great day and I just can't believe how fast the time flies. So here's to a super year ahead for absolutely all of us. This video is made up of some of my mudlarking finds from various different outings, including a very unexpected find. So thank you for accompanying me and I hope you enjoy it. Thank you. see a pipe bowl here which has been um, exposed let's see let's see if it's got much of a stem on it my initial feeling is probably not a great deal but you never know I have been wrong before oh oh I am wrong <laughs> look hey that's pretty good um, yeah it's pretty much of a plain I think the early 18th century pipe for it here. Look what I can see here. Can you spot it? It looks like a little someone. Let's have a closer look here. Let's have a look. Yeah. It's somebody kneeling down with a gun. And unfortunately, as is often the case, he's lost his head. If we can see him a little better, I don't want to um, do too much because he's, he's quite delicate. He looks like he might have a kilt on. I've just seen something down there on the low tide mark which looks worth um, further investigation by that rock. I haven't looked at it yet. It looks like it could be perhaps, I don't know, the top of the lid of a box perhaps. Let's have a look. I don't know, maybe a buckle. Looks like it's got a design on it there. It's quite crusty. It's quite crusted up. I'll have to um, give it a careful wash, I think, at home. I don't want to damage it. But it's definitely got a round design on there. There's a spoon or something here, a spoon or a fork, let's see what it is. Place your bets now everyone. I think it's going to be a fork. Let's have a look, pretty firmly wedged in there. Oh, <laughs> yeah, it's a, it's a fork, it's a bent fork. Sometimes you can see if they belong to some kind of company or something. We'll be able to see that later. I'm 
just dug up a great big uh, jar which is intact and I thought it was plain at first but it's not so what did it have in it let's have a look it's uh Virolax, oh my. I wonder if it's like um, California fig syrup. Virolax, a massive great jar of it too. Oh, this is going to be fun looking up. Oh. Big jar of Virolax. Woohoo! Oh, that's quite funny. Can you see what I'm looking at there? <laughs> wow. Interesting. Oh, <laughs> it's got legs. It's got legs. It's got knobbly knees as well. Oh, that's hilarious. Let's go and wash it. Oh, that's funny. It looks like a character from Beano. Or something. <laughs> Look at those knees. Can you see what I can see? Just down there next to that rock. Just here. It's just the tantalising rim of a clay pipe. Let's see if there's um, anything on the end of it or if it's just a bowl. Let's have a look. Let's get this stone out of the way. Mm, oh, I don't know. I'm not sure yet. Not a very long stem, I don't think. There we are. It's quite a small bowl, actually. It's a tiddly little bowl. Oh, it's ah, it's got a little spur. I'll give it a rinse in a minute. It's very black at the moment where it's been in the mud, but it will fade very quickly back to sort of ivory, creamy colour. Got a friendly crow here, let's see if he wants a little bit of bread. Do you want some bread? There you are, have a nice breakfast. Here's a pipe bowl just down here, wedged in the mud. Let's pull it out and see. See what it looks like. Yeah, it's another um, plain one, sort of 18th century plain pipe. Oh, look what I've just spotted here. It's a pipe bowl with a rose on the side of it. And if I'm right, I bet there's a thistle on the other side. Oh, look, 
it's really delicate it's pretty much broken already but let's just take it out anyway I can stick it together I'm going to take that fragment um, and stick it together and I didn't break it by the way for anybody who thinks I did there's the rose and probably that would be a thistle but we can't see it I'll see if the rest of the bowl is in the mud well I'm home now and I'm going to do a little roundup of the items that um, have been featured in this video. So I'm going to start with this jar here. A jar of Virolax. Now the clue is in the name, um, obviously. And Virolax is or was a nutrient laxative apparently which makes me chuckle because last time in my last video I had the California fig syrup which is also a laxative um, so I can only assume that there's a lot of constipation going on in the 19th and early 20th century and the funny thing is it's not just California fig syrup that have a very aggressive marketing strategy because when I looked up Virolax which was um, made by Bovril uh, in the very early 1900s and they also employ an extremely pushy advertising um, strategy again aimed at mothers um, advising mums to get their children Viralax and viral which was something else which they made um, or else so that your child can grow up to be healthy and happy forever because they've had some Viralax so it is a little bit broken, unfortunately, but it's a huge, great jar, isn't it? So there we are. We have a jar of Viro Lax. I quite like the writing on the jar, actually. Made by Bovril and probably dating to about 1922 or so, something like that. This is my bent fork, just a, an average run-of-the-mill fork. Maybe someone got a little frustrated with it. Perhaps they were using it to eat their Viralax. Who knows? Um, and what else do we have? We've got a few pipe bowls of varying designs. This one here, which has got a nice fluted design. And this one, which has got the these leaves going up the front here, often used to hide the the moulding where it was cast. Any kind of imperfections could be hidden by that design, and that probably dates from sort of uh, mid 18th century, I think. Um, but by the way, I came across this little um, part of a pipe stem the other day and discovered that on it there is a little crouching animal. Unfortunately, his head is missing, but you can see his little back legs there and his front leg um, and probably a tail missing as well. Oh no, there it is. I think that's the tail. Little leg, another little arm. So it's probably a little dog and then that's where the bowl would have been, just, just here. So another very imaginative clay pipe design. I do, I do love those. Who next? Well, we have this little um, lead soldier here. I think he's wearing a kilt, so maybe a Scottish soldier. And no head, unfortunately. Um, probably dates, let's say, early 1900s, I expect, or late 
1800s. And then jumping forward a century or so to 2000, we have here Wilfred from the Bash Street Kids from the Beano. Um, so yes, this would have been given away with McDonald's in 2000, so he's a little bit vintage himself. And his head turns around. There we go. He's got uh, nice knobbly knees. He's got an arm missing. And a little button there that you would have been able to press to make his head swivel around. Apparently, Wilfred is the quietest of the Bash Street kids and suffers from social anxiety. So, two toys from completely different eras. The lead soldier Oops. And, um, and Wilfred. I've got my little uh, compass here, which I picked up. Probably isn't that old, I shouldn't think, but maybe, maybe from the mid-1900s. Here is this um, pipe bowl which I found, which was broken actually, which was um, cracked a little bit. Um, so on that side there, it's got the rose. And then I stuck back in the little piece which um, had snapped off and it is indeed a thistle on the other side there. So the rose and the thistle and almost certainly commemorating the act of union between England and Scotland. And lastly, but definitely not leastly, is this buckle, which during the course of my research took me somewhere completely unexpected as usual. So I did go off piste a little. And so we're going to go back to the Thames foreshore and explore the history the surprising history behind this buckle. As well as the button, there's another type of clothes fastening object that I find a lot of on the Thames foreshore, like many other mudlarks, and that is the humble buckle. And I've brought a few of them along with me here today and put them out for you to see. Um, and although I love buckles, I've never really thought that they were that scintillating until a recent find, which turned out to be a buckle. And uh, it made me realise that, yep, just like the button, a buckle can tell a big story too, even if it's a sinister one. Now, this is the belt buckle that is featured on today's video that I found recently. And when I cleaned it off, I mean, it was covered in a lot of crud and blackness. The first thing that I found, that I saw, was the swastika. And it gave me a bit of a shock. I thought, gosh, it's a German soldier belt buckle. But after a bit of research and some help identifying it by some friends, we found out that it's actually a Hitler Youth belt buckle. As you can imagine I was very surprised to find this belt buckle um, and of course I'm wondering how on earth it came to be in London. I looked up the Hitler Youth and they did um, in fact visit London, some of the Hitler Youth before the war, but I think it's probably more likely that this arrived perhaps as, as a war trophy um, brought along by a soldier that fought in World War II. That's my thinking anyway. But we can tell it's a Hitler Youth buckle by the motto around the edge, which is Blut und Ehre. I'm probably not saying that right. Um, blood and Honour. And the Hitler Youth was the youth organisation of the Nazi Party. So by 1936, all children in Germany over the age of six were required to join a Nazi youth group. The aim being to ensure loyalty to Hitler through political indoctrination so that they would accept Nazi ideals without question. And they all wore a uniform, so this would have been part of the uniform on the belt. 
And it is 1925 autobiography, Mein Kampf, meaning my struggle. Adolf Hitler said, whoever has the youth has the future. So this was part of his carefully thought out strategy. And by 1939, there were 7 million children in the Hitler Youth. Being part of the Hitler Youth involved physical training to ensure that young men were prepared to be soldiers. And for the girls who were part of the League of German Maidens, classes prepared them to be mothers and wives and they were not encouraged to have any further ambitions other than to be a good homemaker. The propaganda for the Hitler Youth was carefully pitched to appeal to children and teenagers, giving them an opportunity to have more freedom from the authority of their parents, and instead to become loyal to Nazi values, with slogans such as Youth Must Be Led by Youth. When I was reading some accounts of former Hitler Youth members, I found myself sidetracked when I discovered the story of Hans and Sophie Scholl, who at one time had been staunch and enthusiastic members of the Hitler Youth. Their sister, Inga Scholl, explained the allure of the Hitler Youth in her book, The White Rose, which she wrote after the war. But there was something else that drew us with mysterious power and swept us along. The closed ranks of marching youth with banners waving, eyes fixed straight ahead, keeping time to drumbeat and song. Was not this sense of fellowship overpowering? It is not surprising that all of us, Hans, Sophie and the others, joined the Hitler Youth. We entered into it with body and soul, and we could not understand why our father did not approve, why he was not happy and proud. On the contrary, he was quite displeased with us. When the Hitler Youth tried to suppress Hans Scholl's creativity and individuality, he gradually questioned his allegiance to the Nazi regime. And in 1942, Hans Scholl, his sister Sophie and some other friends founded the White Rose Resistance Movement, publishing leaflets condemning Nazism. The White Rose was intended to represent purity and innocence in the face of evil. In February 1943, they were arrested by the Gestapo, they were tried, found guilty of treason and executed only a couple of days later. Sophie was just 21. But the positive thing about all this is that their message was heard and their anti-Nazi leaflets were widely distributed. Sophie's last words before her execution were, How can we expect righteousness to prevail when there is hardly anyone willing to give himself up individually to a righteous cause? Such a fine sunny day and I have to go, but what does my death matter if through us thousands of people are awakened and stirred to action? I realise that I digressed somewhat from the Hitler Youth belt buckle itself, but that's what I like about finding objects in the Thames. You just never know where they will lead. And in this case, I'm very, very happy that it led to the brave and inspiring story of Hans and Sophie Scholl and the White Rose Movement, and that some hope and, and bravery, really, this act of courage really shines through in the face of, of something that was a pretty awful time in history, which this belt buckle, of course, does symbolise. So thank you very, very much for watching. As usual, I appreciate all your comments and feedback and have a great week and see you again soon. I've been walking on the same shore ever since the time I left you on the dark side with a promise and a rhyme And everybody else around are beating down on me To leave the only good thing I decided I meant to be Shattered all their dreams They locked me up
up forever.